Welcome to District Dialogues. I am Fulton County District 5 Commissioner Marvin Arrington Jr. And I'm glad to share with you District Dialogues where we share snapshots of events happening in District 5. District 5 encompasses parts of unincorporated Fulton County, Southwest Atlanta, East Point, East Atlanta, and small parts of Union City and College Park. I hope you are enriched by our show. So let's get straight to it. The Wolf Creek Amphitheater concert series is in full effect. We have a phenomenal lineup of shows from now until October. For more information, please visit wolfcreekamphitheater.com for tickets and show information. For more information about my office and our activities, please visit our website at www.fultoncommissionthenumber5.com. In our community kudos section, we give recognition to organizations who are striving to empower our communities. Our next guest is Mrs. Frances Kennedy, Executive Director of Keep East Point Beautiful. Welcome to the show, Mrs. Kennedy. Thank you. So what is Keep East Point Beautiful and, and what brought you to work with them? Well, Keep East Point Beautiful is a nonprofit 501c3 organization that was formed within the city of East Point in 1977. We were formed to engage communities to build environmentally sound communities and engage their residents to take part in it. What brought me to East Point and to the program there is my involvement on a state level was with the state program and then I worked on a national level in private industry and then when I returned home I was asked to come to work with the city of East Point and their program so that's how I got there, roundabout, but always been with them. So this is part of a much larger program. Uh, we are a local affiliate of the Keep America Beautiful program. That's a national program. Uh, Georgia was the first state to become a statewide program. We have over 78 local affiliates in the state of Georgia. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So what has kept East Point Beautiful, um, or what have you done over the past 30 years to help keep East Point Beautiful? <laughs> Well, we've done quite a few things. Because our program is a behavior modification program, we seek to do activities that engage the community to change their behavior so they begin to do the things that we want done in the community. In other words, if we want an environmentally sound program or environmental city, then we have to encourage people to do environmental things. If we want them to take responsibility for it, they have to learn how to do that in a lot of cases. To change behavior, you have to just keep doing things over and over again. So we've done a lot of things. We uh, began simply with just doing local cleanups. Um, we started also doing things to build morale. Uh, we started with the parade that now is a big to-do every 4th of July in the city of, of East Point. 4th uh, of July activities are, are good. Uh, we do things that let you know that the community is taking part. We used to do an adopt a house kind of monthly thing. Uh, we don't do that now, but we try to spread out and we hope that neighborhoods, and some have, take that initiative to do it within their neighborhoods. Well, it sounds like you're doing great work in uh, trying to subconsciously change people's conscious decisions. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but why are programs like this important for the city of East Point and really for any city? Well, programs like this are important for the city of East Point because as a city tries to improve themselves, to gain people to come to their city to stay, for people to come to their city to work, then there has to be something going on in the city or the people have to be able to look at that city and say, oh, they are they are interested in their water systems. So we began, this past year, we began our own Adopt-A-Stream program where we're going to look at, have volunteers within the community able to chemically and bacteriologically 
test their streams or creeks in the back of their home so they'll know what the health of that is. We do a water festival each year for fourth graders in the city of East Point. That's to teach them about the importance of water and that's to work toward the city achieving its water first setting within the larger community of the state of Georgia. So we do various programs that enhance the city and then also give opportunities for residents to take part. So are there, is there anything else that you would like people to know about Keep East Point Beautiful that you haven't had a chance to talk about already? <laughs> well, one thing that we want you to do, uh, want to mention, um, is the Youth Advisory Council. We started this year Youth Advisory Council. We should have six young people, uh, grades 9 through 12, who will also work with us to advise what should happen within the city of East Point. So we try to begin a little bit earlier every year. And then we want people to know that we are always about building partnerships and we're always about volunteering. So we're always looking for volunteers and we're always looking for people to partner with to get the things done that we want to achieve in the city of East Point. Well, we we'll certainly I would certainly be honored to partner with you. Um, how I can look I listen to that? Yes. <laughs> how can our listeners find out more? about Keep East Point Beautiful? They can find out about Keep East Point Beautiful two ways in particular. Um, we are on the website for the city of East Point. Under departments, you'll see Keep East Point Beautiful. Although we are not a department, that's where we're located on the website. And you're also always asked to like our Facebook page. Is Keep East Point Beautiful's Facebook page. And so that way you can keep up with everything going on and the, activities we're about to hold, those in the past that you might have heard about and just want to know something about. So I would suggest those two ways. We also have Twitter and Instagram. So we try to be out there. Uh, we try to, you know, be a part of that social media network, but those are the best ways. And Facebook, I think, is probably the better way. Well, you have to stay current with, uh, <laughs> with, with, with social media these days. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, we'll be back in a moment. Thank you. Welcome back to District Dialogues. It's time now for our Excellence in Education segment, where we spotlight individuals, schools, and organizations that are making strides in the world of academia. Today, we are pleased to have on the show Mrs. E. Shea Collins, Atlanta Public Schools Board of Education member, representing District 6. Welcome to the show, Ms. Collins. Thanks for having me, Marvin. Glad that you could make it. If you will, give us a brief background on yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm originally from the Atlanta area, born and raised in East Atlanta area. Um, I'm a former teacher in Atlanta Public Schools where I taught fourth and fifth grade uh, at Ada Williams Elementary, which was at that time located in the Bourne Home Housing Community. Uh, currently, I am the field program and community director for Jumpstart, which is an early education nonprofit here in Atlanta, as well as sit on the school board for Atlanta Public Schools where I represent the complete South Atlanta um, area. That includes the South Atlanta Cluster, Carver Cluster, Washington, parts of Washington Cluster, and the Thero Cluster of Schools for our city. And uh, if you will, I guess that kind of describes District 6, uh, where, that the area that you represent? Absolutely, geographically, and of course, many of, uh, of course, most of our schools in that area um, encompasses the Carver High School, South Atlanta High School, um, Washington Cluster, and also Thero High School, yes. And Tell us, if you will, about some of the achievements that have been made uh, in APS in general and mm -hmm. specifically in District 6. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I'm just great to announce that we've been great, seeing great progress over the years I've been on the board, which which is the third year of a four-year term. Um, we've seen an increase in our high school graduation rate. We've also have seen um, improvements in our academia and extracurricular opportunities for our children. As you know, we have pushed forward and made, this board has made huge investments in our social emotional learning piece to really make our our school district a no place for hate where our students feel comfortable in expressing themselves emotionally and also handling conflict. In turn, you see a more holistic approach to education that we're taking where we're looking at 
all facets of what what it what our students need to succeed and addressing them accordingly. Also, we cannot forget initiatives that we're making to increase our parental and community involvement in our schools. Our schools cannot cannot be strong without the support of our community base, and so we have really taken efforts, especially in District Six, to really um, inform our community, keep our community informed, and be completely transparent about what's happening in our schools, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, you know, that's so important because in, in, in my job, I see uh, mm -hmm. people, and the criminal defendants, yeah. getting sentenced to anger management. Mm -hmm. But what if they, a anger management is part of their curriculum and they're learning that growing Absolutely. up. And they're learning that at an earlier age so that they don't have to deal with it mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in court. They've already been taught it in school. So that's yeah. really wonderful. Um, I see you guys at the APS have... Uh, enacted your own turnaround strategy mm -hmm. uh, in anticipation or yeah. in advance of any action that may or may not be taken. Yeah. Absolutely. By the governor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Tell us about that, please. Okay. And so as you know, um, the past this past March, the board approved an aggressive turnaround strategy to turn around our lowest performing schools um, in Atlanta public schools, many of which those schools reside in the district that I represent, District 6, and those a lot of those schools in the South Atlanta area where we have seen, you know, historically low performance um, that have for, that I see have really impacted generations of families and generation of st generations of students. Um, a lot, also, a lot, of the, a lot of the schools that are getting um, intense investment and heavy dosage in a lot of academia curriculum area are schools that was heavily impacted from the CRC, you know, unfortunately, the CRCT scandal. And so the turnaround strategy is a combination of uh, different resources and also partnerships to really help support our lowest performing schools. So that includes um, high, intensity, uh, high intensity and high dosage tutoring, um, includes partnerships with, you know, um, potential with, you know, chart other, other um, institutions like charter organizations. Um, Rensselaerville is one of the partnerships in which they're helping some of our schools just develop and understand what it need, takes to develop high quality um, instruction and high quality leadership to help lead some of our schools that are in the middle of transition. And so um, it's very, you know, it's very aggressive. It, it, it comes with a level of controversy, but I do believe any kind of change will have that. And a lot of the schools that are impacted are many of the schools in in um, in the district six area. Um, should we give up our local control and our local ability to elect and remove uh, local school officials, or you think we should turn that uh, responsibility over to the state and the governor? Um, absolutely not, because I definitely think, lo you know, uh, maintain local control of our schools allow us to really maintain local voice of our schools and really making sure that the, our local community stay involved in our schools. There is definitely opportunities for partnerships and collaborations at multiple levels of this, because every there is not one group that is isolated from helping us ensure better education for our kids. So that ca that is at our local level, our state level, county level, state level, and on a national level everyone at everyone needs to be at the table to ensure that our children are, are are receiving the best education because they themselves are going to be our future leaders our future workers our future caretakers and so um, I firmly believe that we you know that there should be a strong sense of local local control of our schools to ensure local voice but I'm not just you know dismissing the fact that we need to have everyone at the table to help get this done well, I'm a proud graduate of APS, yes. just like you. So <laughs> thank you for being here today. No uh, and if you will, uh, just let people know how they can find out more information about APS. Yes, you can visit us at atlantapublicschools.us. But also I want to put a lap, last plug in for our Back to School Bash, which will be Saturday, June 30th, 9 to 1 at the World Congress Center. So we're encouraging all of our parents and families that our students are APS to actually come to World Congress Center and do that one-stop shop for registration and getting ready for school. I was there last year. It was amazing. I yeah. was overwhelmed at how many students and families you guys, yeah. ha guys yeah. had out there. We had to move to a bigger venue because of that. And, of course, school starts Wednesday, August the 3rd, first day every day. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us here today, Ishe. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Thank you.
Welcome back. In our D5 economy segment, we like to introduce experts who can share information about economic development and sustainability. Please welcome Artie Jones, the Director of Economic Development for the City of College Park. Welcome to the show, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Well, glad to have you. Uh, if you will, tell our viewers a little bit uh, about your background and your tenure with the City of College Park. Okay, I've, I've been an economic development director for about 18 years in three different communities. Um, I recently moved to the uh, South Metro area in November 2013, and I've been uh, with the City of College Park uh, for just about three years now. So um, we're doing some great things um, in the South Metro area, and um, I'd like to share some of those items with you today. What is your vision or the city's vision for growth and economic development in College Park over the next five to ten years? Okay. Uh, the city of College Park is interesting in creating a more vibrant community and economic development uh, environment in the city of College Park. And we look at that by making sure that we have the necessary incentives in place to be able to attract uh, quality companies um, and developers to the community, as well as uh, master planning and developing a uh, developing a master plan that would help the city to grow um, in a way that would not um, limit growth in the future. College Park has a um, recently adopted a tax allocation district with the help of the Fulton County government and also the Fulton County Board of Education. And within this tax allocation district, we're looking at a $1.2 billion development that will definitely assist the, the Fulton County schools, um, as well as the, uh, the Fulton County government and the city government as far as tax revenues. We're looking at a airport city on the outside of the Georgia International Convention Center just north of Camp Creek. And with this, within this development, it would be a mixed-use development, which would include hotels, retail, office buildings, some uh, residential, and entertainment venues. And do you have any plans for the Old National area? Yes, uh, the Old National area is a, a huge redevelopment area and what we'd like to do is we're going to be setting up a second tax allocation district that would be located near the I-285 Old National area, Godby Road. Um, this area has, huge, uh, has a huge opportunity for redevelopment. There's a lot of uh, retail spaces that are vacant in this area and, we're, and this intersection happens to be the third busiest uh, intersection in the Atlanta metro area. So wow. we can really capitalize upon a, a development within this area. Well, if you will, can you share with us some of your uh, noteworthy projects? I know you spoke already about the tax allocation district, um, but anything else that may be on the horizon that uh, you'd like to share? Well, College Park has embarked upon a, a mixed-use development called the Pad on Harvard, which is the first uh, multifamily residential uh, development that the city of College Park, College Park has had within the last 40 years. It includes 300 units of, of multifamily residential. It includes an aloft hotel. Um, it also includes a, a four-and-a-half-story parking deck as well as about 30,000 square feet of retail space. And this is all within a two-block area of downtown College Park. Um, also, we're looking at possibly expanding the Georgia International Convention Center also and uh, developing an arena uh, within, uh, bes right beside the Georgia International Convention Center. We're trying to cater towards um, entertainment venue, uh, entertainment venues, and trying to get entertainment back in the South Metro area. And we would like to, you know, that's that's kind of our direction right now. Well, um, if people are interested in economic development in College Park and some of the developments that you're talking about, how, how can they get in touch with you and follow up with you? Well, we have. Uh, if developers are interested in College Park and located in College Park. We have a virtual tour, which is online. It's www.360collegepark.com. 
if they go to this particular website, they can click on various properties that we have available uh, for development, and they can actually zoom in and have a 360 view of the, of, of the area. And this site also provides information on zoning and anything else that's associated with these various properties. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Jones, for coming out today and sharing with us some of the great economic uh, development opportunities that are going on in College Park. We look forward to working with you and excited about the tax allocation district there in College Park. Um, thanks for visiting with us. We'll be right back. As many Fulton County residents know, I'm an executive sponsor for arts and culture in Fulton County. As such, I like to share with viewers during this segment arts and culture organizations and programs that are in our great district and our county. Today, please meet Mrs. Leatrice Elsey, founder of Beatrix Moss and producer and host of the 13th Floor Lounge. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, we're glad that you could be here. Uh, let's start with exactly or by telling people what is Beatrix Moss? Well, and, and, and what uh, is the 13th Floor Lounge? Well, um, let's start with Beatrix Moss. So Beatrix Moss is the company I started. Um, as you know, um, I used to be the director of artistic programming at the National Black Arts Festival. When I left the National Black Arts Festival, I wanted to continue the work that I was doing with artists and with organizations and, you know, not only locally, but also nationally and internationally. And so I started Beatrix Moss, which is a cultural curation firm. So through Beatrix Moss, I continue to work with artists individually. I work with um, small arts organizations. I work with some large organizations. Um, I curate for large organizations like the Apollo Theater in um, New York um, and other you know, organizations like that, as well as um, you know, my own projects. So we've got a social justice project that's coming up in the fall, working with um, young girls right now on a project that will be at the end of this month, as well as um, just got finished with Kebby Williams over in the West End um, with his um, music in the park. So kind of busy. <laughs> and then the 13th Floor Lounge is yes. my, um, and look, is my baby right now. It's my podcast. So it's a podcast about art and culture. So it's a, uh, my guest every month, um, every week is our artists, um, people that are cultural workers, people that are kind of doing this work every day. Um, artists that are creating work, organizations that are creating work. So that's what the 13th Floor Lounge is. So what made you decide to start the 13th Floor, floor Lounge? Well, you know, um, people, when they think about arts, a lot of the times they only think about what they see on the stage or what they see, um, you know, on a film or wherever. And they never really, they don't really know what it takes to get to that point. You know, what does it take to get for an artist to get from an idea to putting something on the stage, and what is that process? And so, um, and then not only that, arts administrators, the people that are behind the scenes, behind the artists, that really, really make it work. They're the ones that commission new work. They're the ones that pay artists to be on stages. They're the ones that kind of out of their minds come up with like these great ideas that they collaborate with artists on. And so I wanted to, um, you know, create a platform for people to be able to talk about what that process is. So in my mind, if, if um, lay people understood the process, they will also be a little bit more supportive of the arts sometimes or supportive of artists who really need support to get work done and continue to put this like really amazing work out into the marketplace. You know, it's funny you say that. You always hear people talk about the music business or show business and they say 90% of it is the business. That's and right. so uh, talking about the administrators and people actually getting the work done mm -hmm. uh, is dotting the I's and crossing the T's That's is right. a real important part of that. And writing the checks. And writing the checks. <laughs> how can uh, your platform, how can your podcast platform um, assist in supporting the cultural and art scene in Fulton County? Well, I have a number of Fulton County artists on. Um, we talk about Fulton County, you know, arts organizations and arts events and what have you that are going on in Fulton County. So really, it's almost kind of an extension of the work that the county is doing through the art centers, through um, the Fulton County, um, the commission, I mean, not the, um, the arts council and what have you. So, you know, we just make sure that we, we broadcast exactly what's happening. And like, really, it's an hour long format which means that artists really have an opportunity to talk. They have an opportunity to talk about exactly what they're doing, how they're doing it, what their needs are, 
Um, and then also, you know, part of our format is to also talk about what's happening in a very contemporary space because the podcast also focuses on not only arts and culture, but also where is the intersect between popular culture? Because we have to kind of, we have to make that bridge happen in order for the arts to continue to be supported and then also for popular, popular culture to continue to expand their perspective. How can our uh, audience find out more information about you and the 13th Floor Lounge and all the great things that you're doing in the arts? Well, they can go to the website, which is, which is Beatrix, B-E-A-T-R-I-X, moss.com. So they can go to the website and see everything that we're doing. Um, they can follow me on Twitter at Leatrix, L-E-A-T-R-I-C-E, and then on Instagram at, at Leatrix313. All right. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you for having me. So Marvin. good to see you. Commissioner, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's good to see you as well. Yes. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, we're very glad that you could share uh, with us about the arts in the 13th Floor Lounge. We'll be right back. <laughs> As we close out today's show, we would like to receive words of inspiration and motivation from Minister Judah Swiley of the Movement Ministry. We are at a time in our country and at our world at large that it is a pivotal moment. I believe that there are being too many walls going up, walls of racism and division, walls, walls of uh, bigotry, but I believe that you can be the one to change it. I can be the one to change it. We can be the one to change it. And I want to encourage you today to be a bridge builder. If you're going to progress in your life, you've got to build a bridge. I think it's important for us to find common ground with those that do not look like us, those that do not believe like us, those that are from other areas of the world. And if we do that, I think we can progress and do what we need to do in the earth. Whether you're black, white, young, old, gay, straight, Republican, Democrat, if you're Christian, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, if you're atheist, wherever you come from, wherever you've been, I want to tell you today and encourage you that your life matters, that you are valuable, that you are special. You have the potential to change the world, but if you're going to change it, you've got to build a bridge. And to build a bridge, you've got to be willing to get down in the water, get your hands dirty, meet somebody where they're at, hear somebody from where they've come from. And if you do that, we can change this world together. Be a bridge builder today. As we conclude today's show, I'd like to invite you to stay connected with my office. You can reach us anytime in our office, online, and of course, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for watching District Dialogues. We'll see you next time.